Bill Johnson had had a beard for most of his adult life. In fact, 25 years he had worn a beard and never shaved. But one day at lunch, Bill decided to shave his beard. And when he returned to work after lunch, people in his office looked at him and said, Bill? Bill Johnson? He said, well, yeah, that's who I am. He says, you don't look the same. You shaved your beard. He said, yeah, you don't look anything like what you used to. Your own family won't even recognize you. And he said, oh, get out of here. No, really, your own children won't even know who you are. Well, on his way home, he began to wonder, will my family recognize me? Do I really look that much different? So he parked about one block away from where he lived. Then he walked home and his children were in the front yard playing. And he came up to the children and he said, excuse me, is this the home of Bill Johnson? And his children's eyes opened wide and their mouths opened wide as their jaws dropped and they turned and they ran inside screaming in a panic, mama, mama, daddy shaved off his beard and he didn't know who he is or where he lives. You get a little bit of time. Why don't you give me the next few minutes? I have a message today that can inspire you, pick you up, give you hope. Really, the next few minutes could change your life and set you free. I'd like to just take a moment here at the beginning of our Bible study together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you will open the eyes of our heart that we may understand what is our hope, the hope of your calling. What is it that you've done with us in making us your own and giving us new life and a whole new identity? Help us to claim who we are in Christ, that we are in Christ, and that you've located us there, that you've made us a different creation. You've made us all over again for a new purpose, a purpose that as we live that out brings you glory and honor. I pray, Lord, that you will help us not only to understand these things, but to value what you've done to us and how you've made us to be. And not only value those things, but learn how to live out what you have put in, that you will help us live the way you have made us to be, and that in that we can have full security of whose we are because of who you are. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your life on the cross and for giving us life with your resurrection. We know you're alive, we love you, and we wanna live with you. We want to learn how to live and how to love from you. So I pray that you'll use this Bible study today to help us on our journey as we become more like you. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'd like to continue in a Bible study in Ephesians chapter 1. And I want you to notice a couple of things because I truly believe the Bible teaches these truths. And if we understand these three truths, it will radically change who we are, and how we live. Now, when I say these three things, I'm gonna make three really profound statements. And I'll tell you that in advance because I have noticed when I teach, when I preach, and when I'm teaching at the university level, I've got college students and I have people in my audiences who can't really tell the difference between my profound statements and my non-profound statements. So I'm gonna tell you, I have three profound statements today and I will let you know what they are when I give them. And, and here's profound statement number one. Your identity is more important to God than your behavior. Hear me correctly. Your identity, who you are, is more important to God than what you do. In fact, He wants you to know who you are because of who He is in your life. These are the reasons why I believe Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are the sheep that belong to God. You are citizens of the kingdom. You are slaves of the master. You are parts of the body of Christ. You are all the things that you are because of him. And if you know who you are, you know how to behave. 
But you don't become something because of what you do. You do because of who you are. Did you hear what I said? You don't do something in order to become someone. You do because you are someone. So the first thing Jesus does is changes our location in life. Our location has changed. We're not just people walking around in this world anymore. He has placed us, God has placed us in Christ. And Christ lives in us by His Holy Spirit. We are located in Christ. Well, where's Christ? According to Ephesians 1, He's been raised from the dead and seated above everything, everything being placed under His feet, under His rule, and you and I have been placed in Christ, raised with Him in the heavenlies, seated with Him on His throne. That's what Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2 tell us. This is so critical that you and I gain that, per, that position. Understand the position that he's, he's given us, that is we're in Christ, and Christ is in the heavenlies above everything. That means we rule together with him. That's right, we are ruling with him. And secondly, we have what he has because we are in him. Now, at the very least, Here's what he has, a perfect relationship with God. Would you agree with me that Jesus' relationship with God is a perfect 10? Well, if Jesus has a perfect 10 relationship with God and you're in Christ, guess what he gave you? He gave you his own relationship with God. That's why you're called a child of God, because he is the only begotten Son of God. He's the only one born from God who came into this world, who is God and is human. And when you are in him, you have that same relationship with God, the God relationship with him. What does that mean? That means that everything Jesus has with respect to God, you also have presently in your life. You have His holiness, His blamelessness. It's right. I, I, know you're, I know you sin. So do I. I know you fall short. You miss the mark. So do I. But as far as God is concerned, what He sees when He sees us, He sees who we're in. He put us in His Son. You stay in Him. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 15, remain in me and I will remain in you and you will bear fruit. The commandment is not bear fruit. The commandment is not do these things. The commandment is stay in me. That which is from the inside of me, just like in the inside of the vine, will flow through the branch, so it is that which is on the inside of me will flow through you and you will bear fruit. You'll live differently because I live in you and you live in me. Okay, so Ephesians chapter one, I want you to listen to two things here. Where you are, you and I are in Christ, and who you are because of what Jesus has done. This is critical, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know how to live. That's the profound statement number one. God is more interested in who you are than what you do, because what you do will come out of who you are. And so we need to work more on our identity, accepting our new identity in Christ, so that we learn how to live. Watch this, Ephesians chapter one, we'll start in verse one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus. Those are saints, holy people who are in Ephesus, Christians who are in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Where are they located? Well, they're, they're in the city of Ephesus, which is a part of Greece. True, that's what it says. The saints who are in Ephesus. But where are they really located? Did you, did you catch that? Verse one, at the very end, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So they may physically be located in Ephesus, but spiritually they're located 
in Christ. Verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, and I believe that should be translated understood as sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I love that word. He lavished upon us. Just imagine you're standing under the waterfalls of the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the power of God. He's poured his hope all over us. He's lavished us in his mercy, in his forgiveness that he is lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. We gain understanding. The longer we stand in the flow, the showering, the waterfall of his mercy and grace, the more we understand that, then the more wisdom and insight we get, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things, watch it, in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to his counsel, the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ. Now he's writing to the first set of believers in the first century. We are many, 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 many generations from those who first hoped in Christ. But we're included in this statement too. So we're going to read it again. In him, verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in accordance with to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and in your love toward all the saints, I don't cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened so that, what? So that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us to believe according to his working, the working of his great might, so that he, he worked in Christ, the same power he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come, that he put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church. Now, listen to this carefully, church. You see, if you're a Christian, you are a part of his church, that invisible spiritual family, international family that spans the whole earth and spans all of time. 
Every individual who belongs to Jesus is a member of his church, regardless of when they lived, are living or will live. They're all part of that invisible spiritual body of Christ. Now hear it carefully. I want you to hear who you are and what you have. Verse 23, he's the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Are you listening? To, we are the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Oh my goodness. I mean, good night, nurse. Think about this just a moment, all right? You are a part of the body of Christ if you are a Christian. You belong to him and he lives in his body. His body is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, but God, being rich in mercy, which with he loved us, he raised us up together with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly. So you were dead, you were buried with Christ, he raised you up together with him. That's his baptism terminology, chapter two. He raised us up together with him, and verse six says, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. That's where you're located. Do you hear me? You are in Christ and he's above everything. So you are above everything with him, in him, through him, and him in you. Your location has changed, which has dramatically changed your identity. Now, if you don't catch up with what God has done, you will not know how to live. And this is critical because the first thing you need to understand is the profound statement, the first thing I said at the beginning. God is more interested in who you are than what you do. Because if you understand who you are, then you know how to live. And you won't be living in order to become what God wants you to be. You will live by what God has already made you to be. There's a difference in that. I do what I do because God made me his child. I don't do what I do in order to be his child. I do what I do because God has made me holy. I don't do what I do in order to be holy. I do what I do because I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I do not do what I do so that I can become a citizen of the kingdom of God. I do what I do because I'm a priest of God. I don't do what I do because I want to become a priest of God. I do what I do because I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't do what I do in order to become the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me so far? I do what I do because, because I am the salt of the earth, because I am the light of the world, not in order to become the salt of the earth, to become the light of the world. Jesus never said become salt. He never said become light. He never said become children of God. He never said become a temple of God. What he said was, I've made you to be a temple. I'm building you into the temple. I'm shaping you into the temple of God, the house of God, which is a house of praise, which is a house of prayer. In fact, Jesus said, my father's house is a house of prayer right? The church, us, we who belong to Jesus, we are the house of prayer. See, if I understand that I'm the house of God, then I know what to do. <laughs> I need to be praying more often, don't I? Now, here's profound statement number one. I'm going to make it again. God is more interested in who you are than what you do. So you need to know these three things and it will change your life. Where you are, you're in Christ. And wherever Christ is, that's where you are. And wherever you are, that's where Christ is. Realize wherever you go, you're taking Jesus with you because he's in you, wherever you go. That gives me comfort and it helps me live the right way because if I can remember that Jesus is with me, there are some things I won't even think about doing or some places I won't even think about going. You understand what I'm saying, right? Because you're the same way. If you remember that Jesus is with you and in you at all times, there are some things you won't even think about doing or saying. 
It helps us live the right way. Not only that, it keeps us away from certain things in certain places, but it helps us to do certain things because we remember Jesus is with me. I'm less likely to fall into temptation, fall in the temptation when I remember Jesus is with me. Why? Because I think ahead and I pray ahead, Lord, I know I'm going to be tempted today. I know that I'm going to be tempted to lie. I know I'm going to be tempted to, to be consumed with greed. I know that I'm going to be tempted with lust. I know that I'm going to be tempted with positions of power. I know these things about me, Lord, and I know basically when they're going to happen. So, Lord, help me at those times remember that you're with me and help me draw from you power to overcome. What am I thinking? What am I remembering? I'm remembering where I am and who is living inside me. And I'm also remembering that Jesus himself can give me the power to overcome. That is so critical. If you don't remember that, you will not live differently. And you, listen, you will always fall into the temptation that has controlled your life all this time because you keep forgetting where you are and who lives inside you. So if you can remember where you are, your location is in Christ. If you can remember who you are, he has changed your identity. And you also then remember whose you are. I need to know who I am and whose I am. Who do I belong to? I don't belong to me anymore, do I? This, this body is not my body anymore. I've been bought with a price. And it's been an awesome price. Jesus paid the penalty for me. He paid what I'm worth. He said, you, Kevin, you are worth my life. He said to you, whatever your name is, he said to you, you are worth my life. You need to stand in front of the mirror one day, look at yourself in the eye, and I want you to say these words, you are worth the life of Jesus. Tell yourself that because it's the truth. That's how valuable you are. Know who you are and whose you are. You've been bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. By the way, I just quoted scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 and 19. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You belong to him. He purchased you. He bought you with his own blood. You're worth the life of Jesus. He's not going to pay more for you than what you're worth. He doesn't overly abundantly pay beyond what we're, what we're valuable for to him. He said to you, you are worth this much to me. You're worth my, you're worth my life. So I will live for the one who is willing to die for me and who really is alive now and he's alive for me as he is for you. He is my head, I'm part of his body. He's my king, I'm a citizen of his kingdom. He's the high priest, I'm also one of the priests. He's the high priest, I'm the temple that he works in. In fact, I'm a sacrifice that he's offering up to the world to serve and to help and to give life, his life, his forgiveness, his mercy, his love. I am all of these things because of who he is and what he has made me to be. And if I remember what those things are, who I am, I'll know how to live. So what you are will also help you understand what you have. <laughs> Did you get that? Because I have been given everything I need in order to live the way he made me to be. All that I need to live the way he wants me to live is given to me by the Spirit who has created me that way. So he's given me everything I need to live as the temple of God in this world. He's given me everything I need to live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. He's given me everything I need to live as a member of the body of Christ, helping out other members of the body of Christ, serving the body and the body together serving the world. He's done all of that for us and he's given us all that we need. So I need to know where I am. I need to know who I am. And if I know who I am, I understand whose I am. And I understand all that he's given to me, which brings me to the last point on this chart that we're going to get into the last time or the next time that I speak with you uh, by video. And that is the blessings, what it is that he's given to us so that we can live out 
the life that he's given to us. We can live out what he has been doing in us. So walk with me for just a moment. I want you to recognize these things. You can, this is profound statement number two, you cannot live in a way that contradicts your self-image consistently. Let me say that differently, okay? You cannot consistently behave in a way that contradicts your self-image. You cannot behave consistently in a way, in a manner that contradicts how you see yourself. Think about the, butterf the, the caterpillar that turned into the butterfly. The caterpillar is moving along and all that caterpillar is good for while it's a caterpillar is to crawl and eat and sleep and poop. That's it. It's all it's good for. Move, crawl, eat, sleep, and poop. And then the caterpillar eats so much one day he goes, uh, he starts to fall asleep. So he forms a cocoon and inside that cocoon, a miracle happens. It's called chrysalis. And then in that chrysalis process, the, the caterpillar inside the cocoon turns to a mushy goo and reconstructs itself into a butterfly. It has a different body, has different legs, different kinds of six long legs. It's got wings. It's got antennae coming out of its head now. It's got different kinds of eyes and has a long tongue through which it can taste and, and get food and bring it into his body. He pollinates because he picks up pollen and he moves it flower to flower and tree to tree. See, the butterflies are miraculous. Evolution cannot explain caterpillar to butterfly. Impossible. That's, that's point number one, I guess, maybe. But also, it doesn't explain us because we were like the caterpillar. All we were good for was that until God changed us. Now, what would happen if after the caterpillar turns into the butterfly and works its way out of the cocoon and comes out and flops around and gets stronger. And then all the, all the new butterfly could think about was, what was life like, like a caterpillar? I'm still a caterpillar. If that new butterfly saw itself only as a caterpillar, how will he live? How will she live? That's right. Live just like a caterpillar. It's just going to crawl and eat and sleep and poop when it could fly and travel and see from a high distance and be of great benefit to the world. No. As long as it thinks it's a caterpillar, it will live like a caterpillar. It needs to catch up in its mind the changes that have occurred in his life. So it is with you, former caterpillar people. You became a Christian. God made you his child. He made you, he adopted you into the family. I know what that's like. I was adopted when I was nine. My mother remarried when I was nine years old and Paul Skidmore stood before the judge one day. The judge said, will you take care of this boy? Will you treat him as your own son? Will he legally, you'll be legally responsible for him all the days of your life and as long as he lives? And he says, I will. And he said, will you obey him? Will you grow up and he'll be your dad and you'll be his son? I said, yes, that's what I want. And the judge signed the paper. He stood stamped it, and in a second, I became Kevin Skidmore. No longer Kevin Fowler. I'm Kevin Skidmore. My, my name changed. I had a new father. I had a new family. I had a new relationship. I had a new role. I am now the son of a coach and a school teacher. Oh, my, my life radically changed when I was nine years old. Did I know all that happened then? No. That I have to try really hard to become the son of Paul Skidmore. No, he made me his son. He accepted me. What I needed to do then was learn what it means to live as a son. And that was hard for me because it was brand new. It was hard for him, it's brand new. See, that's the difference between God when he adopts us into his family. That's what verse, verse four said, right? We are adopted as sons by Jesus adopted into his family. It's his choice to become my father. It's his choice to, through his son, adopt me into his family. 
And at that moment, when I stepped into Jesus, the day you were baptized into Christ, a miracle took place. You were born into the family. You were adopted into the family. You became a child of God. You became a priest of God. Every Christian is a priest. Every Christian is a minister. Every Christian is a citizen of the kingdom of God. We're all equal to each other. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. There are no grandparents. There are no great-great-grandchildren in the kingdom of God. In the family of God, we're all brothers and sisters. We're all the sons and daughters of God. We all have the same father, and we've got the same big brother. Jesus himself is our big brother, and he happens to rule the universe. <laughs> now, you get a hold of that. Because that's reality, my friend. It's time for us caterpillars to change a perspective of who we are because he has made us different. And because I am different, I will live different. But only if I can grab it and see it. That's where the process of renewing our minds comes in. We need to see ourselves differently, then we will live differently. I'm no longer the Jew or the Gentile, the slave or the free, the man or the woman. I'm not any of those things anymore. I'm a new creation in Christ. So are you. And so we see ourselves and we see each other differently. We're now parts of the same body. We belong to each other. Let's watch out for each other. Let's stay united with each other because that's what members of the body do. Members of the body don't cut each other off. They don't mistreat each other. No, members of the same body take care of each other. Right? So profound statement number one, God's more interested in who you are than in what you do. Profound statement number, number two, you cannot consistently behave in a manner that contradicts how you see yourself, your self-image. And profound statement number three, if we know who we are and whose we are, we will know how to live. Our goal, see, this book, the Bible, 66 books inside this one collection, this Bible, written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors in two, three different languages, a little bit of Aramaic, but otherwise is Hebrew and Greek. And God communicated through these 40 different individuals over 1,500 years, one solid collection to reveal who He is to His creation so that we would be able to see ourselves and accept His love. Because I am a broken, fallen individual. I'm Kevin the sinner, and I need a Savior. Jesus said, I've come to offer you the kingdom of God. I will be your king, and I will give you a new life. Lord, I say, I want you to be Lord of my life, King of my life. I want you to rule over me. I need a Savior. Please save me. And Jesus then, as I'm buried under the water, He brings me into His own death so that as I'm raised up out of the water, I'm raised up to walk in a brand new life. Ephesians chapter 2 says that, and Romans chapter 6 says that. As I come up out of that water, there is a miracle that takes place. It is my faith now in action, the Holy Spirit of God moves in and with Him, He brings everything that God wants me to have and He makes me, watch it, He makes me everything God wants me to be. Not to become, but to be. Certainly, I'm going to grow and mature in those things, but everything that I am going to become is already there, though not mature or complete yet. I have all that I need in order to live as God has designed me to live because of who He has made me to be. So if you know who you are, profound statement number three, if you know who you are and whose you are, you remember where you're located, then you'll also know what you have. Then you'll be able to live the way He has called you to live. 
That's been our Bible study for the day. I hope it's been beneficial for you. Will you take just one more moment and pray with me? Lord, the things that I've discussed with the ones who have been watching this video, I pray that you will place in our hearts a greater, deeper understanding of the work and the power that you've expressed in our lives already. That is not something we're seeking somewhere else, but it's something that you've already done in us. You have made us these things. Help us to learn who we are, whose we are, and what you have given us so that we can live out the way you want us to live in this world. And we want to live to your glory and your honor, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.